ಸೋ ಮಾ ಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋ ಮಾ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೂರ್ಮಾ ಅಮೃತ ಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ಟು ದ ರಿಯಲ್ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ ಅನ್ ಟು ಲೈಟ್ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡೆತ್ ಟು ಇಮಾರ್ಟ್ಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಓಂ ಪೀಸ್ 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 ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದ ಬಿಗ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ that's what we are going to take up this morning by the big questions i mean the biggest of them all what is the meaning of life do we exist after death is there a god is there an immortal soul or is there not these are the questions which just about everybody asks at some time in his or her life especially when we are teenagers but then the tragedy is we stop asking and we get busy with the business of life but once in a while sometimes when tragedy strikes or when we are confronted with the awesomeness of nature or something in life we again ask these old old questions humanity has always asked these questions and each generation has asked these questions and found answers found its own answers the upanishads are concerned with these questions come on up there lot of space here upanishads are concerned with the big questions the really big questions in life um they are dialogues between a person who goes and ask these questions to a spiritual master and the answers we get from them you know if you don't stop asking these questions even when you're all grown up then you end up being a a, a philosopher or or you end up being a monk <laughs> <laughs> the great philosopher uh, schopenhauer arthur schopenhauer he uh, said there are two kinds of philosophers the academic philosopher and the genuine philosopher i think the academic philosophers would be hurt when they see this kind of dichotomy between <laughs> academic philosophers and the genu- genuine philosophers and he says the philosopher who looks at life and is puzzled by life is a genuine philosopher and the philosopher who is puzzled by his books is the academic philosopher <laughs> immanuel kant a genuine philosopher he says two things have always filled me with wonder one the starry heavens above and two the human soul within these are the two things that have always filled me with wonder and that is the beginning of spir- of uh, philosophy that is the beginning of spirituality in the upanishads we find these questions being asked and today we shall take up one of these ancient upanishads upanishads we know are the foundational texts of vedanta now in this upanishad the mundaka upanishad maybe we don't know when it was first recited composed whatever maybe 40 centuries 50 centuries ago 4 5000 years ago we find this person who goes to the to spiritual master and asks a big question maybe the biggest of them all the biggest question of them all and uh, i shall recite before you the original sanskrit the vedic upanishadic sanskrit and that's that's awesome too the sounds which first were heard some 40 50 centuries ago to repeat them in los angeles in the 21st century <laughs> that itself is thrilling don't you think it goes like this shonako havai mahashalo angira samvidhi vad upasanna papracha kasminno bhagavo vigyate sarvam idam vigyatam bhavati iti the disciple the seeker his name is shaunaka and the first thing that is said about him is that he has these uh, huge fire sacrifice altars now that requires some explanation thousands of years ago if you went back to ancient india the vedic age you would not find the modern hindu temples nowadays we have these big new hindu temples here in the united states also there is a magnificent one 
in Chino Hills, you, some of you may have seen that. And there are these temples you find in India, huge temples with the deity there which is worshipped and ornate and on a great scale. But even before the age of the temples, it was the age of the fire sacrifices. In the Vedas, the ancient scriptures of the Hindus, one finds a quite a different idea of conventional religion. Instead of going to a temple to worship and pray to a particular form of God, they would offer oblations into the sacred fire accompanied by the chanting of uh, Vedic mantras and pray for whatever they wanted to pray. In a sense, of course, religion has not changed much. Conventional religion is still about um, you know, pleading with God, that I want this, can you make it happen, please? So <laughs> whether it is ancient Vedas or modern Hindu temples or the churches in this country or whatever, mass religion is often of that sort where we appeal to a supernatural power to fulfill our desires. Now, this Shaunaka had large fire altars, sacrificial fire altars, signifying thereby that he was a religious man. In those days, whatever conventional religion was, so he was a religious man. And also signifying he was a rich man. Religion is expensive. <laughs> so, uh, so, he had those um, fire altars, which means he was, uh, uh, he was a well-to-do person, successful in the ways of, in a, ways of the world, and uh, also a religious person, meaning thereby he had whatever this world and the next world had to offer, but he was not satisfied. And this is crucial. If you're not satisfied with worldly life, you're not satisfied with, with what conventional religion tells you, and you become a spiritual seeker. You ask the big questions. And Shaunaka was like that. And he went to a spiritual master whose name was Angira. And it says, oh, there's an interesting uh, side note here. He says he approached the master Vidhivat in the prescribed manner. So what is the prescribed manner of approaching a spiritual teacher? In those days, one way was you would go down and bow down to the spiritual teacher with all reverence and uh, ask your question. Before asking the question, you, you offer something, a gift. In those days, it was usually a pile of firewood. And that makes sense because they had these fire sacrifices. So the master would, would require a steady supply of firewood. Um, so that became traditional. Even when those fire sacrifices went out of vogue, a seeker after spiritual knowledge in India would sometimes take a little bundle of firewood and place it at the feet of the master, and the master would know what he's asking for. Uh, so, and it happened here in Hollywood. Just a couple of weeks ago, this devotee came up and opened a little, cute little bundle. I said, what is this? This is for you, Swami. And he opened it with a little bundle of firewood, not firewood, actually incense wood, but shaped like firewood. And he offered this to the teacher, and he bows down, and then he says, Sir, kasminnu bhagavo vigyate sarvam idam vigyatam bhavati. Sir, what is that one thing by knowing which I can know everything in life? Tell me that one thing by knowing which everything here is known. So that is the big question which he asks. There's none bigger. Before we go into the depths of this question, we must really appreciate the question before we can appreciate the answer. But first, let me say the importance of asking a big question. See, one, when one goes to a Swami or a spiritual teacher, a master, one should ask the important thing, things in life, uh, not mundane things, not things of the world. Our order, for example, runs schools and colleges and hospitals. Those who are from India, you know the Ramakrishna order is well known for its service activities. But often we have to face this very interesting situation where people will come up with all reverence and bow down. It's happened to me. And Swami, I want to ask you something. And I, you know, you're sort of getting ready to talk about Brahman. When he says, Swami, how can I get my son admitted in your school? <laughs> no, when you go to a spiritual master, you ask the fundamental questions of life. What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? Is there God? How can I find happiness and true uh, depth in life. 
you ask these questions. That's what the spiritual teachers are there to answer. And do you make, really make them happy if you ask these questions? You see? Uh, a monk in the Himalayas told us, he was a very great teacher, he passed away recently. He was not of our order, but he was universally acclaimed as a, as a realized master. And he said, you know what, why I keep speaking about Brahman? Whenever, whenever you go to him, he'll, he'll tell you. In fact, the first time I saw him, even before I had asked any question, he started speaking about Brahman, the ultimate reality. He said, there's a secret to this. Many, many years ago, he said, when I was a young monk, a very senior, very old monk told me this thing. He said, there's one thing. I asked for advice, and this old monk said to me, there's one thing you should follow in throughout your life. What is that? Whenever people of the world come and sit next to you, when they come and sit next to you, before they open their mouths, you start speaking about Brahman. <laughs> Why? Because given one opportunity, they'll start speaking about the world, and then you are finished. <laughs> then you are trapped in the world. You see, it is perfectly all right for the ashram to be in the world, but the world should not be in the ashram. It's perfectly all right for the monk to be in the world, but the world should not be in the monk. There can be and should be spirituality in the midst of worldliness, but there shouldn't be worldliness in the midst of spirituality. So ask the great questions. Spiritual life is meant for asking these questions and finding the answers uh, to that. So he asked this question, what is that by knowing which everything is known? Um, I'll put you out of your anxiety, you know, your expectation, what is that? You know the answer, it's Brahman, you've been around long enough. <laughs> it's the ultimate reality, God, Brahman or whatever. But uh, the approach is superb, it's, it's fascinating, the approach. Look at the way the question is posed. He's not asking, is there God or can I see God? What is that one thing by knowing which everything is known? Let's look at the question in some depth. Is it possible to know many things or everything by knowing one thing? After all, if you know chemistry, you know chemistry, but you don't know biology or you don't know Sanskrit. And if you know Sanskrit, you don't know computer science. By knowing one thing, you know that thing. By knowing one thing, you do not know everything. How can one know everything by knowing one thing? That's the question. And the answer, the approach taken here is interesting. You see, we must look at causality. What they are saying is that here are many parts of different shapes and sizes. But if you know that all of them were made from that one lump of clay, if you know the clay, you know the product, the pot. If you know the material cause, the material out of which it is made, you know the product also. What do you know about the product? Follow this carefully. If you know the clay, then you know anything made out of that clay is clay. Absolutely. You may not know. We may not know what kind of pot the potter will make. That depends upon the creativity of the potter. What kind of pot? What shape? Um, that we do not know. It depends upon the ingenuity and the creativity of the potter. But we know whatever he or she may make, it's going to be clay. And not one bit more than clay. The cause in Sanskrit, karanam. And the effect in Sanskrit, karyam. The, the cause and the effect, karanam and karyam, are one reality. The cause becomes an effect only when we give it a new form, shape, a new name, pot, a new function. Now you can, you can put milk or water in that pot and it will hold milk or water which a lump of clay will not. So you have a new function, a new name, a new form and you call it a pot. But if, you, if we look at the pot closely, we see it's made of clay. The top of it is clay, the bottom of it is clay, inside it's clay, outside it's clay. In fact, there is nothing in the pot which is not clay. In fact, if you take the clay away, the pot disappears. So, the substance of the pot, the reality of the pot is the clay. The reality of the effect is the cause. No matter how many varieties of pots you make, it's nothing other than clay, in reality, in substance, in truth. 
And that's what Shaunaka is asking. He is asking, look at this wide world before us. Living beings and non-living beings, planets and atoms and quarks and quasars. This enormous world. I don't think he knew about quasars or quarks, but whatever. He still saw the diversity in the world before him. This enormous world spread out before us. And look at ourselves, our bodies, this complex mechanism, our minds, the subtlety going on within. All of that. Is there one cause from which all of this springs? And if we know the cause, then we know all the effects. In a sense, again in a sense, we will not know the details, but we will know what it is. So this is what he is asking. By knowing the cause, we know all the effects. The reality of all the effects is the cause. Let me tell you a story about Ganesha. In fact, I'll tell you two stories about Ganesha to keep things interesting in the midst of all these metaphysics. Um, the first story con concerns this businessman who was very devoted to Ganesha. And he had, the beautiful, he had a beautiful golden icon, an image of Ganesha. Now, he fell upon hard days and he was forced to pawn off his beloved Ganesha. So he took it to the pawn shop and he gave it to the the, the, the jeweler there, the, the pawn shop owner, and he said, what rate will you give me for this? And the pawn shop owner, he took the Ganesha image and he weighed it, and he said, I'll pay you at this rate, so, much, so, much, so many rupees for so many ounces of gold. Fine. And you know, every one of the gods has his or her own mount. Ganesha has the mouse. And Lakshmi, whom we worshipped yesterday, has the owl. And Saraswati has the swan, and so on. So, but Ganesha has a very humble mouse. Now, the mouse also comes. If you have an image of Ganesha, you will find a little mouse there. So the mouse is also there, and the, and the businessman offered the mouse to the pawn shop owner, and he said, what rate will you offer me for the mouse? And the shop owner said, why, the same rate. It's the same gold. And the owner, the, the businessman was outraged. What? You know, in Hindi, he exclaimed, Ganesh ji ka jo rate, juhe ka bhi wahi rate. How can you have the same rate? How can you pay the same rate for Ganesha and for the mouse? And the pawn shop owner said, Sir, it is Ganesha for you and a mouse for you. But for me, it's just gold. The reality of it is gold. And I see the gold. In the same way, there is one reality here. That's what Shaunaka feels. There is one reality here. We are seeing a diverse world. But there is one reality here, one existence here, which has to be realized, which, which he wants to know. And that's what he's asking um, Angiras, the teacher. You see, all the waves in the ocean, all of it is the waves, the bubbles, the foam, all of it, the surf, all of it is nothing but water. It is water alone appearing in so many waves and bubbles and foams and so on. It is, uh, it is gold alone which appears in so many ornaments and Ganesha and the mouse. So it is one reality appearing in so many ways. Is there one reality which is appearing in so many ways as this universe, as our lives, as us? And the Upanishads, they claim that yes, there is. There is one infinite existence which lends existence to the entire universe and whose manifestations we are. The Upanishad claims that there is this infinite existence. They call it Sat, pure existence or pure being. And they claim further, even greater claim, not only is such an infinite existence there right now, we can actually experience it. The second great claim is it can be experienced. The third great claim is, if you can experience this, if you do know it, then... All the problems of life are solved. How are the problems of life solved? We'll see that a little later. But all the problems of life are solved. In fact, the purpose of life, the Upanishads claim with one voice, is to realize this infinite existence underlying this whole universe. That's what we are doing knowingly or unknowingly. Do it unknowingly, you call it life. Do it knowingly, you call yourself a spiritual seeker. That's what the Upanishads are saying. What's this entire mystery about? It's about that one underlying existence. 
It's not only in the Upanishads. In every religion, in every civilization, when, when humanity has sought the ultimate, has asked these big questions, they have come to this conclusion. Meister Eckhart calls it the ground of being. The Sufi poets in Islam, they found it as the one existence, the one truth in everything. The Buddhist calls it nirvana, the ultimate reality beyond suffering. Though they speak about it in different terms. They, and, and so on. Uh, a recent writer, David Bentley Hart, a Christian theologian, he's written this book. Of course, this book is a polemic directed against uh, atheists, the new atheists like uh, uh, Dawkins or Hitchens and others, or Sam Harris. But the, the book, the name of the book is Sat Chit Ananda, Being Consciousness Bliss. And he says that this is the ultimate conception of God that we have arrived at. And he says it's most clearly found in the Upanishads of ancient Hinduism. But it's found in all the religions too. And this is the ultimate conclusion about God that the, the philosophers and theologians and, and thinkers in religion have come to in every tradition. Pure existence, pure consciousness, uh, pure bliss. So this, nothing less than this is what Shonaka is asking. And what answer does he receive from the teacher? The teacher says to, to, to his question, does not answer directly, but he says something interesting. The teacher says, Tasme sahovacha dve vidye veditavye itihasmayad brahma vido vadanti parachaiva paracha. To him who asked this question, the venerable master replied, there are two kinds of knowledge. The teachers of Brahman, they tell us that there are two kinds of knowledge. You are asking for that knowledge by which everything is known. But before I tell you that, know that knowledge itself is of two kinds. You must know what you are asking. Knowledge itself is of two kinds. The lower and the higher. The relative and the transcendent. The empirical and the spiritual. In Sanskrit, apara, lower, relative. Empirical. Para, the higher, the transcendent, the spiritual knowledge. Knowledge is of two kinds. What are these two kinds of knowledge? And the teacher goes on. Naturally, we have this question. What are the different kinds of knowledge, the, the lower and the higher, what are they? And the teacher, teacher goes on, elaborates. Tatra para Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Atharva Veda, Shiksha Kalpa Vyakaranam Niruktam, Chando Jyotishamiti. He puts forth the entire syllabus. If you go to UCLA and you see what, what, what courses are on offer, here the teacher puts the entire university syllabus before, before you, whatever they had in those days. And he says the lower knowledge is your Vedas, the four Vedas of the Hindus, the, the religious texts, the core religious texts of Hinduism, Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, Atharva Veda, all the related ancillary disciplines which they studied in those days. Shiksha, Shiksha means the, the science of Vedic pronunciation, Kalpa, the, the manuals for performing the fire sacrifices, Vyakaranam, the Vedic sacrifice, the Vedic, Vedic grammar, um, Chanda, Vedic meter, poetry. Uh, Jyotisha, um, uh, Nirukta. Nirukta is the Vedic dictionary uh, by which you know the meaning of the Vedic words. Jyotisha. Jyotisha, yes, somebody is whispering, whispering astrology. <laughs> Whether people know Vedanta or not, they'll know astrology because astrology is much more useful than Vedanta. <laughs> what's going to happen to me? If we are all crazy about finding out what's going to happen to me in life. So it, originally it was a branch of Vedic studies, as the Rishi says, it goes way back to the, to the, uh, to the very uh, beginning of the Vedas. Come on, come on, there's space here. Come, come, come. The space right here. Jyotisha. But what did they need it for? 
actually what they re did they, at that time it was more uh, astronomy than astrology because they used to perform these fire sacrifices and those sacrifices had to be performed at particular times they had to calculate times of the day for performing the, for those sacrifices so they needed some accurate ways of measuring time and that's why they became interested in the movement of stars and planets and so on um, but also what we could today call astrology is a development of that and whether you go to India or even here, astrology is pretty popular. Come, come, there's space here. Yeah. In India, it's uh, in, in the villages, among the masses, there's a feeling that a Swami is uh, supposed, whether he knows Vedanta or not, he's supposed to know astrology. He, <laughs> he's supposed to be able to foretell your future. And one of our very senior Swamis had this very interesting experience to tell us once he was going in a train many, many decades ago and this gentleman was sitting in front of him, uh, from, uh, obviously from a village, and he saw this Swami wearing the robes and he said, read my hand. <laughs> and the Swami said, I don't do that, I don't know how to do that. And the man was outraged. He said, what? You're a Swami, you don't know how to read a hand, who's going to feed you? What do you do? And he said, well, we have these schools and colleges. And the man was, couldn't believe his ears. You're a Swami, you're running a school. Well, whatever for, you should know how to read a hand. <laughs> Another Swami told me this interesting experience. Um, he was uh, traveling to Vrindavan, the land of Krishna. And they walk, the Swamis walk, and they get alms from villagers and, and so on. So he was walking by from Mathura to Vrindavan. On the way, a gentleman gave him generous alms, food and all that, and then asked, Swami, just tell me a number. The Swami was a little taken aback. But he knew what he was asking because he had come across this kind of thing earlier. And uh, he said, he, what he was asking me for was a lottery number. <laughs> he felt that Swami knows astro astrology and so if the Swami suggests a lottery number, we, uh, I'm going to win the lottery. Uh -huh. It would have worked very well here. We had a huge California lottery or something a few, few months ago. And I asked the Swami, what did you do? Um, I said, very gravely, the Swami said to that gentleman, you wait here. I'm going to Vrindavan. I'll, on the way back, I'll tell you. That's just a day's walk. So on the way back, I'll, 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 I'll tell you. You wait here for me. And that person with great devotion said, yes. And he sat down there under the tree. And I said, what did you do? He said, well, I went to Vrindavan and then I stayed there for three years. <laughs> <laughs> All of this, a pundit, yes, it, it's true that, you know, a, a great pundit who knows Vedanta, he knows the different ancient philosophies, Sankhya, Nyaya, he's got degrees and all of them. And he was about 95 years old when I met him. Um, uh, in, and we just discussed a little bit about Vedanta. And then he said to me, sort of confiding in me, you know, I have sort of moved on from Vedanta to astrology. I said, why? Whatever for? He said, Vedanta doesn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> so a person may be a great pundit. Sri Ramakrishna used to say the vultures soar very high. The vulture soars very high in the sky, but its vision is on the carcass. Where are dead animals which it can swoop down and eat? So in the same way, mere scholarship is of no avail. One must actually seek that spiritual knowledge. One must ask the big question. Not a big question and the Vedanta is the answer to the big question. But if the Vedanta is answer to the question, how do I make money? Then, then astrology might be a better option than Vedanta. Um, the teacher gives this entire range of knowledge, whatever is available and says, all of this is the lower knowledge. Then the question arises, if everything that I know, the entire library is concerned with lower knowledge, then what is the higher knowledge? You have exhausted the entire syllabus, the whole library. But where, what, then what, what talks, what is the higher knowledge? And the teacher says, Parayayata daksharam adhigamyate. The higher knowledge, the, the uh, spiritual knowledge, transcendent knowledge is that by which one knows the akshara. It's a nice word to learn. Akshara in Sanskrit. It also means the letters, alphabet. But Akshara, the meaning, the etymological meaning of the uh, word is the indestructible. 
the unchanging. The unchanging, indestructible, one constant in this universe of change and destruction. That by which you know this akshara, you realize this akshara and go beyond the suffering of life, attain the goal of life, that knowledge is the higher knowledge. I think this is a good time to tell another Ganesha story. <laughs> yeah, Ganesha stories are very popular in India and I'm surprised to find, find that Ganesha is popular in the United States too and I asked, I, I wouldn't have expected it. Why is Ganesha popular, popular in the United States? After all, a little overweight little guard with an elephant ed, head, why, would, at, why at all would people be interested in Ganesha? <laughs> and uh, somebody said, well, everybody loves elephants, elephants are cute. So. <laughs> Yeah, she's saying elephants are cute, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the story is very interesting. Ganesha's parents are Shiva, the great god Mahadeva, and his mother is Parvati, the divine mother. And his brother is Kartika. Kartika is the god of war and valor and, and um, you know. And his sisters are Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge, Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Now one day, Parvati, the Divine Mother, called the little boys aside, the Divine, uh, the little gods aside and said, well, here is this mango, in some stories it's a, it's a diamond, and I'm going to give it to the first one who goes around the universe. It's a popular children's story in, in India, but there's a deeper meaning to it. I'm going to give it to the first one who, who can go around the universe, and off you go, it's, it's a cosmic race. Who can travel around the universe first and come back to, to the mother? And Kartika, whose mount is the, is the peacock. Uh, so he is confident. He says, oh, that's, that's easily done. And Ganesha can, can, is no match for me. Just look at him. He's overweight and he's slow. And, uh, and his mount is a mouse. Whereas, look at me, I'm, I'm fit and strong and fast and my mount is the peacock. Somebody said now he might have replaced it with a drone or something like that. <laughs> Whatever, he is very up to date and he's very fast. So he jumps on the peacock and he flaps away to circle the universe. It goes off into the skies. And Parvati looks at Ganesha and says, my dear, aren't you going to do something? Ganesha says, if you insist. And, and he sort of gets up and I, I imagine the Mouse trembling, here he comes again. Why can't he shed a few pounds? <laughs> but he doesn't go to the mouse. He folds his hands in reverence and then he circles around his father and his mother, Mahadeva, Shiva, and his mother, uh, Parvati or Uma, and goes around them three times and bows down reverentially to them. And he says, I salute thee. O oh, divine parents of the cosmos, going around thee is as good as going around the universe. Jagato pitaro vande parvati parameshvaro. I salute the, the, the divine origin of this universe, Shiva and Parvati. You see, exactly what Shaunaka had asked. If you know the cause, you know the effect. If you know the clay, you know whatever varieties can be made out of clay because they are all clay. If you know the gold, you know whatever ornaments are made out of gold. Not the varieties, but the essence you know. In the same way, if you know the divine reality, you know whatever is produced, manifested in that divine reality. Think about it. This vast dream world which we inhabit every day, we go to, we, we fall asleep and dream. We meet people, things happen to us, we go to places, and when we wake up, all of that resolves back into you, the dreamer. The one who was sleeping on, his, on his, his or her bed and dreaming the whole thing up. That entire cosmos of our dreams is nothing other than the mind of the dreamer. That's an example. Exactly in the same way, there is one infinite reality here. Pure consciousness, out of which is projected, manufactured, created, whatever you call it. The Sanskrit word is srishti, projection. The entire variety of this universe. Now, there are two ways of knowing this. One way is individually. 
I will know all life and study biology. I will know the chemistry. I, I will study all the elements. I will know the basic stuff of this universe. I will study physics. I will know the cosmos in it. And you go on studying. That is the method of science, the method of Kartika. Forever flapping around on the peacock. When you see, study the effects severally, separately. That's one kind of knowledge. That's what the teacher said. <coughs> knowledge is of two kinds. One is the lower knowledge where you know the effects. You know each one separately. And you study all of them. And there is the higher knowledge, the transcendent knowledge, where what Ganesha did, the Ganesha approach to answering the question. When you know the divine essence of all things, the existence, consciousness, bliss at the heart of, of all, all manifested reality. Parayaya tadaksharam adhigamyate. The higher knowledge is that which, by, by which the eternal reality is known. Now, obviously, our question is, what is that eternal reality? What is that akshara? Tell us. And the rishi, the teacher, obliges in, in magnificent language, I mean, unsurpassed poetry. He says, Yadadadreshyam agrahyam agotram avarnam Achakshu shrotram tadapani padam Nityam vibhum sarvagatam susukshmam Tadabhyayam yad bhutayo nimpari pashyanti dhira He says, there is one reality, but it is invisible. Adrishyam, you cannot see it with the eyes or with any of the sense organs. You cannot see it with the eyes, you cannot hear it with the ears, you cannot taste it with the tongue or smell it or touch it. Can we go up to it in pilgrimage? Can I go to a holy place and find that place? Find that ultimate reality? Agrahyam. It is not an object which you can walk to or grasp with your hands. It's not an object for sense organs. Not an object for our motor organs either. Why not? He says, Avarnam. It is without attributes. It's without color or shape or size. It, it has no attributes by which you can grasp it. You can, you can sense it. Agotram. It is without any source. You see, everything in the universe has a cause, a source, a root. And the root or the cause and source of everything, itself being the causeless cause, is called this akshara. Agotram means which ha does not have any cause to it, any, any source to it. It itself is the source of everything else. Just like the source of all the parts is the clay. But the clay is not one more material, one more item of pottery, which, which you can say that its source is clay. Clay is indeed the source of all things. Clay is not one more part. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, the example goes like this. Suppose you have different golden ornaments, um, a necklace, a bracelet, uh, a ring, and somebody comes and says, these are ornaments. But the reality of all of them is gold. Now if you start searching for gold other than the ornaments, you're never going to find it. Because gold is not another type of ornament. It is not a fourth type of ornament. There are only three types of ornament in this example. There's a necklace, there's a ring and there's a bracelet. And if you say gold, gold is the very existence of that necklace, ring or bracelet. Swami Vivekananda says, the ultimate reality. It is not that it exists. It is existence itself. Things exist. But the existence itself is that ultimate reality. It is not that it's a particular kind of knowledge. Knowledge of God is not a particular kind of knowledge. It is knowledge itself, Swami Vivekananda says. It is not that the ultimate reality is happy. It's a happy feeling. Rather, he says, it is joy or bliss itself. That's the meaning of the Sanskrit words sat, chit, Ananda. Pure existence or infinite existence, pure knowledge or infinite knowledge of pure consciousness and pure bliss. Existence, consciousness, bliss. Ajakshu shrotram tadapani padam. So it's poetic. It says, everything is known to that. It is omniscient, but not like us. We know things, things with our eyes and ears, but that ultimate reality knows everything directly as a manifestation of itself. It is one with everything, and hence it does not need eyes and ears to know things. It is omnipotent, that ultimate reality, 
pure existence creates this entire universe. So it's omnipotent. And yet it does so without hands and feet. Aparnipadam means without hands and feet. It's omnipotent. To do something, we need hands and feet. We need instruments to work with. But that ultimate reality manifests the entire universe, including us, without any instruments, without any media, via media. Nityam, it is eternal. It is eternal. Everything that we know, we ourselves, these bodies, they are subject to what they call the six-fold changes. Birth, that's one change. After birth, we come into existence. Coming into being is the second one. Growing, developing, maturing is the third one. Mature stage, middle age, where we reach a peak, that's the fourth one. We keep on changing without developing any further. Then we start, the body start deteriorating. The fifth one, and then destruction, the sixth one. So they say our bodies and just about everything undergoes changes. But this ultimate reality does not undergo any change. It is eternal. There was never a time when it did not exist. There will never be a time when it will not exist. In fact, even this word eternal is with respect to time. One of the Swamis in the Himalayas pointed out, he granted the existence of time, we say that Brahman is eternal. It is, be, it is before, uh, it, it is without beginning and without end. But actually, even time depends on Brahman for existence. Brahman is pure existence and time exists means it borrows existence from Brahman. Vibhum, the Sanskrit word Vibhum is very interesting. It means vividam bhavati. It appears as everything in this universe. Just like clay. It is a lump of clay. It appears as all the pots and pans you make out of clay. In the same way that one attributeless existence appears as this entire universe of things with attributes, with qualities. Living and non-living, moving and non-moving. Sarvagatam. All pervading. Think about it, the way, the effects are different from each other. The bracelet is different from the ring. The ring is different from the necklace. A big part is different from a small part. But what is continuous through all of them? The cause. Through all the ornaments, one thing runs common to all of them. They are all gold. The gold is common to all of them. The gold is all pervading the, the ornaments. The clay is all pervading the, the pots. I put it in this way, you know, the advantage of this, let's think about it. It sounds very nice, it sounds very philosophical, all pervading. But what good is it? Let's see. This is a funny little example. In the Pacific Ocean, imagine, a little wave is born and it comes up. The wave is growing bigger and bigger and rushing ahead and it feels good. Oh, I'm growing bigger. Look at all these other waves. What fun. But very soon, the fun changes into little problem arises. That wave is much bigger than me. I'm a little jealous of that wave. I wish I could be as big as that wave. And look at these tiny little waves. Oh, they are no good. <laughs> In, inferiority complex. Superiority complex. I am bigger, much bigger than the bubbles. They are no good. They just go like that. Problems. Difference. I am this much and this world is so different. They are all different from me, all these waves. There are some waves who are nice to me, they are my friends. There's other waves who are not so nice to me, they are my enemies. They are different from me. And then the real terror comes. Oh my God, what's that? That's, and the wave next to him says, buddy, that's the shore. <laughs> that's California rushing up towards us. The shore. That's death. That's doom. And the wave thinks, oh my God, I'm going to die. Now a Vedantic wave comes along. <laughs> and says, there is something called water. Yeah, yeah, what's that? Well, this water is immortal. It doesn't die like us waves. Really. And this water is all pervading. It's in all waves. There is nothing greater than this water. So the water doesn't have a problem of a superiority complex. But it's also the same in all waves. So it doesn't have a problem of inferiority complex. And it's one with everything. 
So the wave says, good for water, but what about me? I'm going to die. <laughs> and then the Vedantic wave tells him, you are water. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. The top of you is water. In the middle is water. In the bottom is water. The sides are water. In fact, look around you. All you see is water. A wave is a name and a form and an action given to water. The moment the wave realizes this, it becomes one with the ocean. That little form will go ahead and dash against the shores and disappear into, into surf. But it doesn't care anymore. For it, it becomes the infinite. And from that point of view, all are same to it. We are one infinite existence. Now limited to a particular body and mind. But if we analyze, as the Upanishad will sh show us, that I am not the body, I am not the mind. I am this existence consciousness bliss shining through the body and mind. And then I find that existence consciousness bliss is eternal. It doesn't die. It isn't born with the birth of the body. It doesn't die with the death of the body. It doesn't get old. It doesn't get sick. It is the same in the president of the United States. It's the same in the homeless person. It's the same in a multi-billionaire. It's the same in, in the person on welfare. It's exactly the same. And you are one with it. You are that. That as the Upanishad tells us, you are that. You are not this particular little wave. You are not this particular little person you thought yourself to be. Mr. So and so, or Mrs. So and so. That person is there. It goes on like the wave rushing towards the shore. Yes, but now you are no longer terrified. Now you are no longer afraid. You, we learn to identify ourselves with the Akshara. Where is the akshara? Right here, within ourselves. The Upanishad tells us it is to be realized in our own hearts. There's a saying that the one who ignores the God in one's own heart and looks for God outside is like the person who throws away a gem in the palm of his hand and looks for imitation jewelry in shops outside. That infinite reality is available to us all the time. It always was available, is available and will remain available to us in our own hearts, in our own consciousness, in our own existence. We are that. We are not limited to these little bodies and minds. Vibhum sarvagatam susukshmam, subtler than the subtlest. The gross universe, this universe is gross and physical, physical universe. Subtle is our minds, thoughts, feelings. Subtler than that. What is subtler than the mind? Consciousness. The witness of our minds. We are the witness. The mind is a mask. The body is another mask. But we are the witness consciousness shining through this body and mind. Susukshpam, tad avyayam, that unchanging existence consciousness bliss. Bhuta yonim paripashyanti dhira. The wise look upon that as the source of all existence. This entire universe you see is rooted in that one existence, which you are, which you are. When Swami Vivekananda, as a young student, first heard about this from Ramakrishna, he made fun of this. What? This entire universe is one with God. Pots and pans, and doors and tables and chairs, they're all God. What craziness. And Sri Ramakrishna came and touched him. He said, why are you saying that the rishis are crazy? And he touched him. And when he touched him, so Sri Ramakrishna could do that. He didn't have to give a Sunday talk. <laughs> he just touched him. And Narendranath indeed saw inside and outside one, unchange, one unchanging, undivided ocean of consciousness. He writes later on, he walked towards his home, this little park there called Hedua Park in Calcutta. The park is still there. There are iron railings on that park. And he remembers banging his head against the iron railing to see whether they are really solid. Everything seems to him to be made of consciousness. There was a coach, horse-drawn coach, rushing towards him. And he says, I felt no, no impulse to step away from it. Because I felt that is consciousness. This is also consciousness. It's one Brahman everywhere. Luckily, he did step away from it. That's why we are here today. His mother gave him food to eat. His mother gave him food to eat. And he mixed up everything and he ate it. 
the different tastes were not, he could taste it, but their different tastes were not important. The underlying reality was one Brahman. And his mother said that the poor boy has got some terrible disease, he's going to die. But he snapped out of it and came back to this kind of awareness later on. The same Vivekananda, who made fun of non-dual Vedanta when Ramakrishna first told him, came to this country, would come in the years ahead to this country and proclaim, Christs and Buddhas are but waves in the ocean that I am. I there is not Vivekananda. He's not saying he's an ocean in which wave, Krishna and Christ are waves. Rather he says, he identifies himself with the pure existence consciousness bliss, which we all are. And we can all say that. It, as infinite existence, the entire universe, it's a wave in me. Mai ananta maham bodho vishwa vichi swabhavata. I'm an infinite ocean of existence. Consciousness, bliss, and this universe is a wave in this ocean. Udetu vastamayatu name vriddhi navakshati. Let the wave rise, let the wave subside. The ocean neither gains anything by it, neither loses anything by it. Let birth come, I am not increased thereby. Let disease and death come, I am not decreased a little bit also thereby. Fame and dishonor, success and failure. They neither increase nor diminish my essential reality. That infinite existence, consciousness, place which I am. The universe is a wave in me. The teacher goes on to say, how does this entire universe arise, arise in Brahman? Again, beautiful poetry. Yathorna nabhi srijate grinhate cha Yathapithibhyam oshadhaya sambhavanti Yatha satah purushat keshalomani tatakshrat sambhavati havishwam says just as a spider a spider spins a web out of the material of its own body so the universe is produced or is, is emanates from the the immutable akshara just as herbs and plants uh, and grass grow on the earth in exactly the same way the, the universe appears on the uh, immutable reality. Just as from a living human body hair and nails grow, each example is, is uh, used to prove a different point. The spider example is used to show that Brahman does not use any other material. There was no storehouse of quarks and super stings on which Brahman worked to make the universe. The entire universe, quarks and super strings notwithstanding, all of it is, is projected from Brahman itself. It's that existence which appears as this universe. Indologists misunderstood sometime. I remember reading this book written by a well-meaning English Indologist. He writes, the ancient Hindus worshipped a cosmic spider. <laughs> no. I mean, I have come across all kinds of gods and goddesses in Hinduism, but no spider so far. <laughs> Clearly, the Upanishad says, like a spider. An example. It means an example. Like the earth, effortlessly, the spider works hard to make a web. But the earth effortlessly emanates um, vegetation plants and shrubs. In the same way, Brahman effortlessly projects this universe. And so is Brahman insentient like, the, like clay or the earth? He says, no, like a living body projects hair and nails and all. In the same way, the pure consciousness Brahman projects an insentient universe. The unchanging Brahman projects an ever-changing universe. Brahman, which is pure bliss, projects a universe of struggle and strife, just the opposite in nature. It's a projection. The reality always, right here, right now, is existence, consciousness, bliss. Upanishad tells us, we are that reality. Brahma Veda Brahmeva Bhavati. The one who realizes this reality becomes that reality. Becomes means it's not that we are not that reality and we will become that reality. We are already that. And we have to investigate within ourselves. All spiritual practices, prayer, meditation, Philosophy, everything, all of it, unselfish action, rituals, all of it is ultimately meant for this one purpose. Shankaracharya says in one of his commentaries, Brahma Pratipatti Artham, for realizing one's identity, for realizing 
I am Brahman. I am an immortal, infinite existence, consciousness, bliss. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Om That is infinite. That meaning the Akshara, the higher one. This is also infinite, what we experience. This infinite arises from that infinite. In this infinite, if you can recognize that infinite, that infinite alone remains. Om, peace, peace, peace.